the byproduct of it is that we've removed nature. Yeah, a lot of these principles are us just reconnecting back with the way that we used to live. Colin here, CEO of Wild Foods and Inner. I'm here with Matt G, because we have two Matt, so Matt G. And what do you, tell the wild audience about what you do here at uh, Wild. Yeah, so I am <clears throat> essentially chief of staff uh, at Wild. My job, which we just kind of like talked about, is to keep uh, our employees happy healthy and effective. So making sure that all our departments are communicating with each other, that we have the right people in the right roles, working on their zone of genius, making sure that they're being effective and that, you know, I hop on, you know, essentially attack sessions with the, the head of the departments just to make sure the initiatives are getting fulfilled and make sure you're happy overall and we're making money and having fun doing it. And you are, you would consider yourself a base person. I, How would you define base, by the way? And what we'll also do, and don't edit this out, because remember, we're all about showing behind the scenes here. We're going to record a good summary of what the video's gonna be, and you should put that first. We shouldn't start the video with like, nobody gives a shit about, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so based, what based, is that? Because it yeah. kind of plays into what we're gonna talk about today, well, which are the 10 rewilding your principles for health. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually coined a based boy. Uh, <laughs> okay. Me and my roommates are based, we're the based boys. Uh, and we actually started something called Base Brands, and that's yeah, something I actually that, like that name. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're working Good on it. Good thing that worry. failed. No, oh, no, it's it still fail? going. Okay. Don't worry. We got some <laughs> stuff going on. Um, but we defined based as is coming closer to an inherent truth, and we kind of view this around health. And it doesn't, you know, based is now have been like something more controversial. So it's like, what does the mainstream media say? It's yeah, you like, just take does, the opposite view almost. But right? it's not always like that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't inherently make something based. But I think it's just coming closer to something in the truth. And something uh, we, like our, one of our main principles was the Lindy, like the Lindy principle. Lindy effect? The Lindy effect. Made is famous it by Nassim Taleb. Yeah, yeah. Is it Lindy is kind of like the Explain question it. we ask. So there's several ways of viewing it, but the way, a very simple way that I've put it is the amount of time and the amount of use that something has had in its past is directly proportional to its use and how effective it will be in the future. If a book's been selling for 100 years, it's likely to keep selling for 100 years. Yes. If an idea has been utilized by, let's say, all hu human nature, like the fact, like meat eating, for example, then we're going to probably keep doing that. And it's also probably where the tr truth is. Yeah, it's right? somewhere. It's somewhere right. in there because of its prominence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then we would also talk about interesting things like like um, like books and like writing and, and information gathering. And it's like, oh, like how does the internet come in? Because the internet is something fairly new, but it's, it's just essentially information and gathering. So it's like the, this, this idea of, of doing something and it, it can work through different layers, but it's still that inherent process of gathering information. So the Lindy effect is something that is inherently based and a good way to figure out if something is based yeah. and or if it's, it's uh, you know, effectiveness to health. Yeah, and then so for me, the backstory is, I used, the first podcast I did four years ago was, I called it the ancestral mind. And I had interviewed like all the big carnivores and just some general health people and whatever. And my philosophy is always, what our ancestors do? Cause they were thriving apex predators. Like they're the reason we're here. They figured out how to dominate every other species on earth, basically domesticate them and become top, top dog apex predators. So it was like, what did they do with literally perfect health, no cavities as you know, per less than a, a price. Mm -hmm. um, and then just surviving in an environment with literally no medicine, no, like no technology. What did they do? And then how is what we do today different or similar? And what you find almost universally, the things that they did, if you can mimic in some way and build into your daily routine, your, your health outcomes go like this. Yeah. And anything that you take that they didn't do that you are mismatch or you do differently, like being inside under fluorescent lights all day, is what I say a mismatch. Your health outcomes go the opposite direction. Everything from psychology to why we buy things to why we procreate to, to monogamy to marriage to warfare to money to economics, every single thing is explained when you first understand pre-agricultural revolution and post. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to ask me to pull on any threads there, or maybe you could run us through what what changed big agricultural revolution and on? What were the big changes in human species environment? I mean, it's a lot of things. I think it's a consolidation of resources, and then it allows for more leisure time, which is inherently a good thing. Like we were always hunter gathering, we were always scrapping around. We were all we didn't. We, we began to have leisure when we were able to allocate resources into small areas. And then well, we were like, well, maybe though, because maybe the rich did, because actually farmers, remember? Yeah. 
hunter gatherers, this the research is that we would work like 20, 30 hours a week to gathering food. Farmers, when we started farming, like especially pre tractors, industrial revolution chemicals, was then like they worked way more. We worked 40 to 50, and the nutrition was lower quality. Yeah. And you got cavities and you got bone loss and whatever, yeah. right? But then eventually, if you were able to accumulate resources, then you use that to leverage other people and, you know, yeah. you have as much leisure as you want. And then you right? get people that become Renaissance mans and focus on all these other esoteric things. Funded like by some, somebody wealthy. Yeah. Patrons. And also, like, you know, all of human kind was has been furthered not by like we'll just call it like the peasants and like people well, explain do, that what do you mean well like we got to get to our 10 principles at some yeah, point yeah we got to get to our we're talking about right yeah now. yeah yeah this well, is a long preamble to yes, get there yes, I promise. yes yes yeah so okay. I, I mean my point with that let's just so i don't kill it on the peasants quote um mm -hmm. is like scientists and, and inherently the like people that were like scientists are what moved society forward so then when we were able to have le more leisure time we allowed them to start focusing on more science more math more arithmetic more engineering and things like that and then that's what progresses society forward while there is also this huge amount of base level of people like still doing the hunting yeah and well, and what, what you're talking about is specialization yeah, yeah because when you could go like for example there was a recent video a guy did where he made a chicken sandwich from scratch and it took him like six months <laughs> Raising, like raising the chicken, farming the bread, like literally the whole process was like, if you want to make your own chicken sandwich, good freaking luck. Yeah. But because we have specialization, you can get the eggs from that person, you get the bread from that person, and you literally have it in your fridge, and then you put it together. Yeah. Right? So specialization, you know, you had people that were farmers, you had tanners, you had blacksmiths, you know, you had all these, you had merchants, money lenders, you had all these things which allowed for you to specialize, right? And then from that, also you got wealth profit and then you bought your time because you had other people do whatever so you know economics is the reason we're here but the biggest change from pre-industrial revolution to post is that we move from nomadic hunter gatherers with a very small idea or almost no idea of personal property to now we are stationary we grid a pot of land plot of land we grow food then we have to protect it and that comes in warfare it comes in economics it comes in looting like literally everything that uh modern culture society even pestilence because like now you need sanitation because you're all living in one air yeah. in one air you know what i'm saying but like as nomadic hunter gatherers we don't have to contend with any of that yeah right so it fundamentally changed everything and it's why we can have iphones and cameras and all this stuff and it's awesome and i love it but the byproduct of it is that we've removed nature yeah and maybe and that can be our segue into yeah and yeah, yeah so we have the the, the 10 rewild principles yep yeah so i i think with your point of like the pre and post agricultures a lot of these principles are us just reconnecting back with the way that we used to live. And mm -hmm. so like one point, and we can, we can talk about this is I think one of the most underrated health hacks in the world is grounding. And this means just putting your skin, mainly your feet, but your body in contact with the earth. It's this, it's this wild thing is if you think about how much us as like Western individuals, how much we actually ground, it's probably like, yeah, exactly. Can you zoom? So what, read what it says right there. Uh, it says grounding has shown to de decrease inflammation significantly. And on the left is before and all that red and all that yellow. Right, this is, is where they, they ground somebody. And what it is is you're just reconnecting with the electrical um, force that is earth. But we don't do any of it. And every other animal, and if you go to like to hunter-gatherer tribes still living in the world, they ground all the time. They're because they're basically barefoot, sitting on the ground, whatever. Yeah, exactly. And we've and created we this do, artificial barrier we do around us. Like we literally right. do none of it. If right. you are not purposely grounding, you are not grounding. Yep. And I, I think that's such a health, uh, such a, an interesting principle. And it's again, it's just going back to the ways that we would have lived while also still being able to like use technology and, and do stuff right. like that. And just trying to like essentially hack it. And a lot of the stuff is free. So we can run through, we can run through this and yep. kind of give a little brace, a uh, little brief on each of this. So the first one's food. Why don't you tell me like yeah. how you view that? And let's, let's try to keep this short too. And before you go to that though, if you go back to that ancestral mindset philosophy that I have, it's like, think about what our ancestors used to do. Okay. Outside all day. Mm -hmm. Right. We used to walk 13, 15 miles a day. That's average uh, hunter gatherer walking. Right? Is mine too close? Too far away? From my mic or? Okay. Got, so we walked 13, 50 miles a day. We slept on the ground. We sat on the ground. We climbed trees. We did, we did things that were connected to earth. Now, and I promise each one of you, because we've got two behind the camera, we've got two here. Think about how often you were actually in contact, barefoot, without shoes on, on with mother, like earth herself, you know? It's like five minutes. It's like, it, it, yeah, because you, you can walk from car to home, <laughs> shoes off, staying home all day on a concrete pad that we have here under fluorescent lights. So we went from 100% outdoors to 
five percent outdoors. Not even. I mean, or maybe even less. Barely. Modern humans. This, the research is in America. We spend ninety percent of our time inside. Okay. Huge mismatch. Okay. So if all you do is just go outside more, all your health outcomes go like this. Yeah. But then you look at something like grounding, and you actually get the scientific explanation of free electrons and, 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 and reconnecting, dissipating, and all these different things, right? And Earth is just actually just this big magnetic ball of spitting out electricity. Do you know that the Earth gets struck by lightning like 70 times a second all over Earth? So if you actually looked at it in high speed, it's just like lightning going everywhere all over Earth, you know? It's fascinating, by the way. But you get more inflammation because you're not connected and you have these free electrons, electricity in your body and, and whatever. Uh, but then you go outside and that there's just the natural flow of this energy does its thing. And you don't have to think about it, right? But it's the same thing with like light. And that's one of our principles. We are also indoors. So that means artificial light 90% mm -hmm. of the time. So you take somebody like Jack Cruz, who's like a big light guy, melatonin yeah. guy. And he's like, his whole thing is how mismatched we are with the light, not getting sunlight and all these things. And you're like, okay, again, we spend 90% inside. Our ancestors spend 100%. If I was 100% outside, light wouldn't be an issue to have it. Grounding wouldn't be an issue. I wouldn't have to do any of these things. Right. And so one of the like core big principles is just like nature, like just go outside, just go outside. Right. But when you, it's not even that though. It's not just that. It's like when you think about it from an ancestral mindset, you can identify everything in your life and figure out how far in that spectrum you are closer to what nature intended or further away from what nature intend, mm -hmm. intended. And so that's why everything we're going to talk about today is like you run it through the lens of thinking ancestrally. Okay. Now we'll talk about food. And honestly, this is not going to be, we're not going to get through all 10 of these in this one. We're going to have to have a 10 series podcast on just this. Right. Great. Yeah, but this is like the intro primer, yeah. right? Yeah. And so food, um, how would you, how, what do you think is probably the ideal human diet or like, you know, how would you answer that yeah. big question? So, so in my schooling in the Czech Institute, uh, one of the first things, the, the, there's two really simple ways you can start this archetype is one, where are your ancestors from? People more in the polar regions tend to eat more animal foods to plant foods in because a ratio. Because that's what their ancestors had access to. Yes, and they also right. have smaller smaller colons, smaller, smaller less large fruit. intestines. Yep, way less fruit. Like you didn't have just avocados and berries and right. oranges just all ready for you. And you definitely you. didn't have like tropical fruits. Yeah, definitely right. not, never. Yep. And then as you get closer to the equator, that starts to bulk up with more plant foods, more fiber, and you also like- And more fruit, because sun year round. Yep, right? exactly. So yep. that's a really good way to start. And then secondly, was this really simple questionnaire of like, how do you view food? And like, do you love, love, love eating? Which is a lot of people that are in the polar regions. And then some people are just like, it's like hard to eat. It's like a chore to eat. Um, do you mm, like- I heard that. that yeah, yeah. Do you tend to like, like more animal foods versus more plant foods? Do you tend to be a sweet person versus like a salty person? Do you tend to, um, like after a workout, what do you crave? And it's like these really simple things. It's like, okay, that's the starting block. And you, you start with whole foods, less processed foods, um, organic foods grown well. And then it's like, okay, what is my optimal animal to plant ratio? And then it's also like, what are you doing that day? Are you not moving around a bunch? Okay, you're gonna eat less calories. You're probably gonna eat more plant foods. Yeah. Are you like crushing workouts? Are you outside in the sun? Okay, you're gonna need more calories. You're gonna need to probably eat, eat more animal foods. So that's, that's my general basis to start. What's the absolute uh, you know, foundation? If you had a whole foods. one, okay, whole real foods. Yes. Right now, but even within that, you have a bunch of different categories. Yeah. Whole foods shipped from Thailand or whole foods from that farmer around the corner. Yeah. Which one's better? Closer. Right. Okay. So like whole foods is for most people, like 90% of the way there. But if you yeah. want to really dial it in, be perfect. Like we get raw milk from a local farm, mm -hmm. organic, no grains, no hormones, probably like the best raw milk you're going to get anywhere. Yeah. Right. Uh, the next step up would be like, cold, or not cold, but like slightly pasteurized, like organic, uh, Alexander farms, which is like a newer brand. And like, it is mass produced, but it's like, they're trying, it's, it's a better, better it's, still, it's a better option, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like raw milk, then that, then like maybe organic horizon. If I have nothing else, yeah. even though it's like a, a more, then it's like store bought regular conventional milk. Yeah. And then it's like, you know, then we can keep going. Um, so fully small batch, organic grown foods that, that are local is like the, it, the ultimate. Yeah. And from that, one thing you can do, because again, it's not about perfection here, but it's like, what can you change your daily life? So if that's the foundation and you have to buy your food, where do you start? I think honestly, one of the simplest ways, and people always say farmer's markets. I like that. Cool. I was going to say that. Well, that's, I, was, that's, I was teeing that up. No. Why are you going to say anything else? That was the answer. Well, no, <laughs> farmer markets are really good, but also like a lot of people can't do it sometimes. And it's a lot. So I think a really cool thing to do is um, CSAs 
like and, and reaching out to Basically these local the same farmers. Thing, but yeah. So you can reach out to butchers and they will just send it to you locally. Sure. So like I used to work in the meat industry and one of the hardest, it's very low margins, and the hardest thing is shipping meat nationwide. Right. The key to it is shipping meat locally because right. I, you can get, you know, we're in here in Tampa, you can get a farmer up in the top, in the northern part of Florida to send you a package and that is 10 times easier than me sending and you can Texas. also pick up from local yes like exactly. there's a local small farmer farmer stand that's 24 7 it's not just mm. sundays yeah, yeah and yeah. they have the best ribs i've ever had and yep. i've been looking for a good local ribeye right it's local it's small batch no hormones whatever right we also get a raw milk delivered uh we don't actually go to farmer farmers markets a lot because i mean in, in fact in some ways to your point you kind of get better quality sometimes when you go outside farmers markets. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. even farmer farmers markets themselves have been has have become a little commercialized, mm -hmm. and you see like more just like they'll just buy blueberries and then put them in like or, things. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, <laughs> but again, it's the key of like, can you go there and find local farmers? And a lot of time, you're always going to find meat. And farmers. then hook up with them. Too. And, then, and then you know, go there every week or buy from them, deliver, buy in bulk, whatever, right? And so yeah. that's the kind of foundation. And then the next level is like higher quality, organic, best quality you can get. And then the next level is like organic stuff, maybe from Costco, even though I'm not a fan because it's mass produced, but, but it's like, it's better than Walmart organic. And then yeah. it's just like Walmart food and Publix food. And you just keep going up like that. Right. And then you keep going up to processed sugar grain, laden grain, uh, corn, wheat, and soy subsidized, whatever. And th and you go all the way down to the foundation. And so, because if you take the ancestral mindset or the ancestral perspective, what did our ancestors eat? Just think about it. like what all they? who all whole local foods that, that they, they had get. to literally get that with yeah, their and own it was hands. Also, and also, I think a really big point is like ones that they didn't have to work too hard to get. Well, some. some well, wait. Somewhat. What do you mean? I mean, there there are tribes that would that would literally dig up tubers. I've seen that are like this big, yeah. and I mean they're like hours and hours and yeah. hours. You know, yeah. so it's like yeah, but also, but it's still whole real food in the ground. Yes. with no pesticides. I mean, this is something I think me and you like agree on is like having a bag of pistachios is whole food. But that's not how they would have found them in the environment. And like having like a bag of unshelled pistachios is like hundreds of hours of work yep. that we would have had to do that you can just put in a bag. And that's why they're so calorically dense. And that's why eating those whole foods all the time might not be the best match. Yeah, it's not, well, so found, so Michael Pollan, so he famous author, written a bunch of books. He, um, he basically said like, eat whatever you want as long as you cook it. Yeah. And like, that's like a pretty good proxy. Mm -hmm. Now, of course you can buy a lot of cheap pasta and make that or whatever but but it, but at least you would go from like restaurant food and like packaged food and corporate cooked food his whole book i think it's called cooked is about that it's like as americans we've moved from like used to do more home cooking meals at home and stuff this i'm gonna elbow it whoa oh you hear that too when i do this Yeah, whatever you like do, I hear it. oh my god i'm gonna have to come from like the side or something yeah. like i can't have my hands in here because i'm trying to move work with my hands um the whole book cooked is about that. We've gone from, you know, generally more small and local because we didn't have industrialized food to now everything shipped all over the world. And a lot of it's pre-cooked. Yeah. And when your food is pre-cooked, more preservatives, more additives, more flavorings, Less whatever, availability. like everything is just yeah. worse. And, and, and then, and then restaurant food too. Yeah. So if all your food comes in a package pre-cooked and you're having restaurant food, you're actually not cooking like raw ingredients in their state. And that's like a big problem of our food industry right now. Yeah. You know, so I think I think a really big thing to that too is also just making and this is something we talk about at, at like within our company a lot is making the decisions easier and I know this point has been like talked about so much but like meal prepping like tons of meat and tons of starches and other things at once so that you can just it's now not a, you don't have to make these tons of decisions you don't have to sit down and cook if you don't want to it's like oh I just have food ready and that I think is like one of, so like start with whole foods and then make it easy to easier to eat those whole foods. Yeah. Because everybody knows they've bought, went to the farmer's market, they buy all this amazing food. And then the week goes by and you're like, crap, I ate out like five times today right. and I have this food just went bad. I spent, not only did I spend an expensive amount of money, a lot of money on this good, great food, but I didn't use it and I yeah. ate out. Yeah. Well, all habits die or survive or thrive based on the prep, right? An yeah. ounce of prevention is worth pound of cure, Franklin, yeah. right? And I was actually, I wrote an email about this, this Sunday about that. It was, the idea was like, it's what's in your environment, first of all, right? So if you're eating out a lot, you should ask yourself why. Um, are you hanging out with people that do that? Is like, do you, are you out at work and you, you don't have anything? So maybe you could have packed a lunch. Yeah. And so it's a quick option. Or do you not have a system for your food at home where you feel like you can make something tasty? Now for me, the simplest way, like if all you did was just have a good steak in the fridge every time. I always try to have two or three steaks that I can make up in about 12 minutes and like literally better than a steakhouse. Yeah. And I have my whole system for it. I've been doing a charcoal rub lately. 
unbelievable. That's my meal. I don't even worry about like a size. Like I usually I'll grab some kiwis or fruit or whatever. Yeah. So I have, I have some fruit that's ready to go. I have my steak as the bulk. Keep it simple. Maybe some fish here and there, some frozen fish. Um, and like as long as that's in the fridge, when I come home, like I always know what I'm going to eat. Yeah. Right. So, but that happens at like, where am I getting my steaks? I bought steaks that are not good. Like I've, I've gone through different steak suppliers and like, I'm not happy with them. It doesn't make me want to eat them. Then I lean more towards the eating out because my mind wants that dopamine rush of like tasty foods. Yeah. You know? So you have to like find what foods you're going to eat from which suppliers and then build a really solid routine. And if, and if you're the type that maybe don't know how to cook a steak well or whatever, you got to either like hire somebody to prep for you or like have your wife or significant other, like maybe they prep the steak and season it and then you throw it in a pan. Maybe they chop it into cubes, some marinade and you cook it up. There's a lot of ways to do it, but it's always going to come down to the preparation level that you do. Cause the more you prep, the easier everything else is on the yeah. back end. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I, I gotta we gotta wrap this up though because I gotta I gotta okay. get out of here. It's it is We got through one principle. Yeah, it's two fifty one. Um, you guys talked about grounding, I'll talk about one like principle in depth. I think that was a really good one, like on Yeah, so this would just be like the real food principle or something like that. Let's just wrap it up and just say like um, yeah, we're just Well let's think about what we can let's there's give a, a few there's a lot of clips in there. Yeah. I'm about clips as y'all Absolutely. Know. Let's let let's let's do a few tips. On so, food? On food. Okay. This includes sourcing, cooking, whatever comes to mind, recipes, whatever. You go or I'll go, you go. Think about something. Mm, you go first. Okay. So um, stainless steel with a rack pan that you get on Amazon. They're this big. So you know how your baking sheets are this big? I get ones that are this big. It's perfect for a single steak. Okay? Because mm -hmm. what you do is you take a steak out. It gets, it gets gooey everywhere. I take the rack out. I put the steak right here. I let the goo fall into here. I pat it dry. Do that. And then I, and then I basically on top of the rack, I rub the steak down in my salt. And then I cook it in the pan. I usually press the steak down, really rub the seasoning and whatever, kind of do it like this, maybe even beat the steak a little bit. It actually helps. Make it uniform, throw it in a preheated pan, a little bit of ghee or tallow, and then basically two minutes until there's crust, good. Yeah. Then flip. Now, here's the secret of this little pan system, and I literally travel this freaking pan, right? Once the steak is done, what's the most important thing you're supposed to do? Let it rest. Okay, <laughs> so, but you don't let it rest on a cutting board or a plate because it makes the crust soggy. And I, I'm telling you, the amount of friends oh. I've had go cook steak where they throw a bunch of steaks on a plate and there's juices coming outside and it hurt. I like, I'm, I'm like, I'm pain, I'm in pain watching. You put this. it on. You put it on the you grate. Put it on the rack. And if the steak is thick, that rack goes in the oven mm. to finish. Yeah. And you need airflow around a steak. This little stupid ten dollar piece of equipment is like my entire steak routine, right? But it's like an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yeah. My steak process with that, and now I have this one charcoal season I've been doing, which makes the most beautiful crusts. It's so dialed in. So my only failure point in my routine, because I usually fast most during the day or I'll have like lunch, whatever, but I come home, it's always just a steak. If there's no steaks that are defrosted, I have a problem. Yeah. Now I have to like find some other solution. I don't, I'm not in the mood for chicken or I have leftover, ugh, right? <sighs> I'm mean, just, it's just like, that's so powerful, right? Yeah. Like, just do that thing, right? Yeah, yeah. It's so awesome, you know? I, yeah, I also think, so something that's really big for me is just simplicity in the meals. Like, I don't think you need to get that One steak, complex. super simple. Yeah, yeah, and like, I'm like eggs, apples, cantaloupe, melons, rice, and red meat. That's like seriously, 80, like yeah. mostly what I eat. And also like, so that's that's a really big one. Like, make things simple, less decisions, less room for outside influence and not knowing yeah. what you gotta make. And then something that's really big for me is like, practicing the 80-20 rule. So like, I'm a fit guy. You know, I'm strong in muscles, but you know, I think people overestimate how much work I actually put into like staying fit because it's been a consistent 80, 20 rule for the last decade of my life. And you know, I eat out and thankfully I, I, I don't have like a, some people have like celiacs and they're way more susceptible to like influence from, from poor food. Uh, but you know, I eat out every once in a while, and the that's physically okay. fit can enjoy their vices. Somebody a long time ago said that, like in the 1800s. Yeah, right. You have much more leeway. Also, think about it from a biomechanical perspective. When you're more insulin sensitive, and you eat a bunch of carbs, dessert, whatever, there is little net less fat gain as a result of that, mm -hmm. right? If you're more insulin resistant, like literally every gram of even one strawberry might be like spiking, making it worse. Right. Yeah. So there's that there's digestion. There's like how strong is your gut health, like gut health for digesting food. Literally everything across the board is better when you're more physically fit, you know, but I guess your point is like, you don't have to be perfect. It's more about consistency and yeah, the foundation. And it, yeah. And it's not about like just destroying it one week and then falling off the plan. Like bring these habits in. And even if I go out one weekend and we eat crappy food and I might drink a little bit, it's like, okay, I know that, you know, I, I, I don't, and I don't like get, Oh my God, this is so bad. It's like, 
like I celebrated that. Like, let's have fun now, like back on track and, you know, get a little bit harder back on track. And then also like to surround those meals with healthy habits. So like walks beforehand, walks after getting good sleep so that you're insulin sensitive. Grounding, going outside, sunlight, yeah. rather, and, and all of which we're going to get to in the rest of our, our 10 And most of those things are free and they're actually pretty darn simple with not a lot of buy into it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I see people all the time are like, I'll start my diet Monday and I'm like, why don't you start your diet the next time you put food in your mouth? Yeah. Like what, 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 what are you talking about? Right. Yeah. And I mean, we could get into an entire kind of like psychology trauma therapy session around food. And cause it's like, it's <laughs> one of these things that's like, it's so intertwined with like your upbringing. And I mean, I had, when I was a kid, if you didn't finish your meal, you sat at the table and I had kind of jerk off, um, mom, ex-boyfriend guy that literally dumped a place spaghetti in my head because I didn't eat my food. And I'm just like sitting there, like, I'm sure it's traumatizing. It's funny, but it's like also f- up right and it's like i don't know maybe that's something to do with some of my food because i have a big sweet tooth um and i actually almost always finish my food so maybe that's why you yeah. know for, for better or worse right but yeah, you but, crush uh, food whenever we go <laughs> i love it <laughs> right um so food trauma would be, would be uh, dude seriously right yeah and that could be like a whole series you know um so i think we'll wrap it up here so this is gonna be on this is the wild podcast or like wild youtube right um you can find us in i mean you can find our whole catalog on wildfoods.co. Mm-hmm. Use code wild, actually use code YouTube. I th- let's just make it. YouTube for 15% off anything. And we have a collection there of obsessively sourced superfoods, supplements, functional foods, things to help you um, eat better, live better, et cetera. Check it out and subscribe, like, and share. And Matt will event- at some point have his own social following he can plug. Do you have one? Yeah, Matt Grabowski. Okay, spell yeah. the Grabowski. Uh, It'll M- be in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. M-A-T-T-G-R-E-B-O-S-K-Y. Got it. All right, so this is one of 10 that we're going to do. Yeah. So this is the first series. We'll call this the Real Food Series. I'm going to go through all the Rewild Your Principles. You can actually find the guide at wildfoods.co at the top under guides. It's the first thing that says Rewild Your Life. Cool. Peace.